Hi, everybody. Welcome to CW Trending. My name is Jeff Sloan. I'm editor in chief of Composites Hurl. I'm joined today by Ginger Gardner, and she's our senior technical editor. Ginger, how are you today? I'm great. Um, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, tours and technology trends in 2022. The year is is coming to a close rapidly, and we've been out and about a lot. We've uh, been on a lot of plant tours, visit a lot of facilities, seen some interesting things, and wanted to talk a little bit a little bit about what we're seeing and what we're hearing, and how we think that is uh, shaping the composites industry. So I'm going to start with. Um, Actually, my first tour in 2022 was to NIAR, visited NIAR, the National Institute for a Aviation Research at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, we published that tour in August. If you haven't seen it, we've got a link here for that as well. You can find it on our website. Um, really eye-opening for me. Um, the, the amount of processes and equipment and facilities that NIAR has established is really really impressive and i think that comes through in the tour um and if it's highly accessible as well i you know i suggest if you're ever in the wichita area which of course is in the middle of kansas um you stop in and check it out it's just a really interesting facility um another tour i did this year was avcarb um avcarb is based in lowell massachusetts very atypical facility here because avcarb manufactures composite uh, sorry carbon fiber papers and fabrics for use in fuel cell systems. So very different from we know what from what we normally see, which are structures, carbon fiber structures. Uh, so different application here, but very interesting technology that is coming out in our October issue. And so you'll be able to see that tour very soon. A couple other tours I did uh, when I was in uh, the Boston area for my visit to Avcarb, I stopped by to see Boston Materials. Boston Materials is a startup and is focused on developing technology to produce uh, Z fiber, um, Z fiber reinforcement capabilities, reinforcement materials, and um, uses a really interesting technology to orient milled fibers in the Z direction to provide interlaminar strength properties, and is producing those um, in a in a film roll format that can be applied very easily to in a lot of different applications and composites manufacturing. So um, look for that tour to come out very soon. I'm working on that. And then I also visited Orby Composites up in Denver and Orby's special specialty is thermoplastics. And one of the interesting applications here, you can see here in this photo uh, is a wheel. This is uh, for an ATV. Um, and so you can see that thermoplastics um, capabilities here and the capabilities of Orbi and the kind of work they're doing, especially with compression molding, is is very interesting. That'll be coming out in a couple weeks as well. Um, and, to... Yeah, now we're going to move to, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Ginger and she's going to talk about some of her visits recently and what she's seeing. The Dowdy was the tour that I did after JC this year um, in the UK. And that was just fascinating. They have a very long history in making composite propellers for um, turbine aircraft, turboprops. And these are bigger propellers. They, um, what I can't get over is they have a 95% yield rate on these propellers and it's a complex process. It's a, a multi-step, uh, very high requirement uh, process. And one of the things that, um, I thought was really interesting. It's RTM based and they make a preform and then there's some other steps involved. You can see some of the pictures up here where they have um, hot drape forming they're looking at to help in putting that spar preform together. And then you can see the radial braiding and then the RTM machine on the right. And one of the things they've done is they did a four year project with several groups there in the UK, um, NCC and the uh, AMRC. And they looked at how to digitize their process. So they don't want to at all reduce the reliability um, or the precision, but they want to gain flexibility and gain the ability to increase production rate if they need to, because they realize the industry is changing. So that was really eye-opening to see what they're doing. That came out in our August issue and there's a link to it there. The tour that I'll be publishing in December is of Robotics. I also went to see them uh, after JEC. They're in Lorient, France, 
and that's kind of the hotbed of um, racing. And you can see for sailboats, you can see the sailboat there on the right, this uh, 60 meter class. And um, th these are just massive boats. And the foils that they're using, um, they're they're very, very large and they're a primary structure. That's what these boats are actually sitting on when they're flying through the water. And um, what's, I think, you know, the interesting thing for me with Avell is that they have two Coriolis machines and they're using AFP to make these structures. It's kind of unheard of to um, use AFP in the marine industry, but you can tell that this kind of structure is actually more akin to what we might see in the aerospace industry. And so it fits very well. Um, so that tour will be coming out and you can see how thick these these uh, structures are. And the reason that they went to this method, this kind of digital fabrication of these parts instead of hand layup is because the hand layup parts actually were falling, failing. And um, the the CEO of the company was managing a team. And before he invested millions into buying these carbon fiber structures, he wanted to make sure he had some that wouldn't fail. And so that's how this company got started. Using this kind of manufacturing allows them to have a more reliable structure that performs well in the long term for these teams. The uh, most recent plant tour I did was Middle River. Um, it's actually air structure systems. I, I keep wanting to say aircraft, but it's air structure systems. And they're uh, called MRAS. They're outside of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. This was just amazing. This is a massive facility. This is the original Glenn L. Martin aircraft factory from World War II. It was actually uh, built a lot earlier than that, uh, I think in the late 20s, early 30s. And it's over a million square feet, and it's 100% dedicated to composites and metal bond. And I had no idea. I knew Middle River had been around. I knew it was um, a Lockheed Martin facility for a long time. Uh, I had actually visited it when I worked at DuPont because they were using uh, Nomex honeycomb in some of the uh, acoustic panels, which get all these you know holes uh, drilled into them. It's, amazing thing um but that site just blew me away on the left up here you can see in in that shot where you kind of see the floor uh and going back to the back of the facility so those are the original wooden bricks that were the walkway kind of the the traffic way for the Glen L. martin facility when it was first built and in the back that whole door lifts up it's a big garage door and they would lift it up and push out the amphibious planes and launch them in the middle river for you know, World War II. It's just got so much history. But I um, I was really impressed because, you know, this is a this is an old facility. It has a long legacy. They specialize in the cells. They're part of the um, Nexel uh, joint venture with Safran, but they're also owned by ST Engineering in Singapore. And ST Engineering is a very high technology company and very forward looking. They're the world's largest MRO provider for maintenance, repair, and overhaul on the airframe and engines. Um, and so what uh, the guy, my guide was Mitch um, Smith, and he's their sustainability and their composites leader. And, and that's his job. You know, one of his tasks is to not only work at MMP and make sure that he's supporting all the programs they have. They have at least seven different nacelle programs going for seven different aircraft. But he also has to work on sustainability. And how do you do that with this really old facility, this massive facility? You're never going to uh, make sure it's energy efficient because it just wasn't built that way. Um, but so what they focused on is using digital tools to help them get a hold of efficiency. And um, one of the tools, they have a lot of tools they use. One of the tools is Platane. And so that's a webinar that's coming up in two weeks. And I love Mitch's strategy. It's, hey, look, you know, this is implement as you go. We've got production on an ongoing basis and you just do it as you can. It's not rocket science. You know, we make mistakes sometimes when we start up. We have things situated a certain way and then we change. So, for example, if you look on the lower left, you can see two electro impact cells and those are used to do one of the layups on one of the nacelle programs. And at first they had each cell with its own control house. And then now what they've done is put the control center in the middle and they have a robotic tool change out. And then the, the guys that are running the control system are situated just what, where I'm standing. Um, they were on either side of me when I took the picture. And that way they have, you know, one set of controllers. They look at both machines. And right here in the middle, you can see some of the digital 
uh, tracking they're doing, they're tracking those AFP machines all the time. And then just above that, where you see the yellow and the green and the blue, that's called Predator. And that's a software that tracks all of their CNC machines in the whole plant, no matter what they're doing. And they're looking at the efficiency of the machines and the downtime and the setup and how they can improve that all the time. Um, so it's just little things like that. On the other side of those digital tools, I took a picture of what you can see. There's a square sitting above like a doorway. That's an RFID antenna. And that's picking up RFID tags that the Platane software will then um, register so they can track the materials and tools and parts as they move through the facility. And they're still working on RFID. They're not sure if that's the end all be all for them. Um, they're also looking at Bluetooth and a range of other sensors. Right now, they've kind of gone back to barcodes for a little while because they're having to work with their workforce and make sure their workforce is comfortable and on board with everything. And that's a process. It's a it's organic and you know, eventually they'll end up. What I love about it, she's like, hey, look, it's not like you're not going to make mistakes. Um, you are, but you learn. And as you learn, you'll um, you'll be able to optimize that technology and make it work for your operations. One of the things they have, if you look at that blue on orange picture, that's a, a four station hot drape former to make curved hat sections that reinforce some of the nacelles. And, you know, Mitch did that on his own. That's a local supplier that's not coming out of Europe or anything. That's just something he worked with to say, OK, we need to get rate right up on this one uh, you know, piece because we have multiple um, multiple units of these hat stringers on these nacelles. And that's a that's a, a rate program that's like 60 a month. Um, so that's, you know, you have to sit there and think, OK, we got to have more rate. What are we going to do? And that's what he said. You know, it's not like we throw automation at everything. We throw it where we have the pain uh, when we have rate 60 on a program and we've got to figure out how to get, you know, the layups. Um, then that's what we do. We, you know, anytime you said I can buy from four hours to 12 minutes when I'm at rate 60, that's worth it. You know, and that's where we spend our money and that's what we try to do. On the lower right, you'll see the tool there actually uh, lifts and moves. And all of their tools do that. All of their layup tools move um, to help the um, layup technicians and make it more ergonomic for them. And that's another part of his efficiency is I don't want to have high turnover. I want to, you know, these are key workers. It takes a while for them to get their skill up and they do such a good job and it's it's demanding and we want to make it as user friendly as possible for them. We value them. So that it was just great. It was a great tour. I learned a lot. Um, I think he has a great story to tell about taking a facility that has 90 years of experience in airspace, moving forward with a company that says, hey, we want to help you and make sure we, you know, we're on the cutting edge of technology as we go forward. And so, yeah, they're just taking one step at a time and, and putting in digital tools as they can. All right, we'll talk a little bit about some of the trends that you and I saw. So why don't you start here? So I just talked to you about Middle River and what they're doing. This, These are two news items that just came across our desk this week, but we've been watching this happen for a while now. Um, and we've written about it in the past. I had a whole series on, on digitization and how do you start? Where do you start? And it was companies like Dynexa that makes carbon fiber tubes and Platane again and other companies. There are a lot of different software, by the way. When you do... Um, when you do cutting and kitting on like the Eastman machines, I didn't know this. I Mitch told me this when we were in Middle River is um, they actually have software in those machines and those machines as they go, you can. So the Platane software will let you nest. You can dynamically nest like 10 parts at a time. But then how do you then separate it back out to make sure that each of those plies go to each of the stacks for each of those 10 parts? And Eastman has software that will light up all the plies in a different color so that they can then be sorted manually or by a robot at the end of the conveyor into those 10 kits, right? So there are a lot of different software programs you can use by the different manufacturers. And that's one of the nice things about Platane is they are open architecture to let you feed that kind of stuff in and they'll work with you. But here's another ex example, Velocity Composites, they have a new digital manufacturing cell. And so um, this was a press release we just got and they're talking about why are they doing it for the same reason that Mitch is doing it. They want to cut waste, save money, improve the supply chain. Boeing, I mean, Airbus just put a press release out this week that um, they've averaged 37 aircraft per month on the A320 family, but they need to hit 50 for the last four months of the year. And so that's what they're going for. And they're not backing off rate 75 for 2025, rate 75. And so that's why Mitch has looked at digital tools and automation. That's why Velocity's doing it. 
the supply chain needs this help. We need the digital tools to help get us to where we need to be on production and then sustainability. Um, so one of the things that Velocity is looking at is by having these digital tools and they can track all the plies, um, they're doing what Middle River's doing by the nesting, but they're also looking at the logistics and Middle River talked about that too. So it's great and the nesting's great, but then you have to be on the other end of it using software to help you actually get the kits together and get them where they need to be on the floor. So all of that has to be traced and tracked and made efficient. You know, things get lost. It's not uncommon to lose your tools or your parts on the floor sometimes. These mass, these facilities are massive. And so that's what we're trying to now move through as an industry. Um, we're trying to really tighten up on our process control. Um, I was talking to one of the sensor companies, you know, I've been working with a lot of sensor companies and it's called Sense This, S-E-N-S-T-H-Y-S. And they have different sensors that they can put on tools or parts. And the the technology actually came out of the semiconductor industry in California. And he was explaining, he said, but don't you understand what Six Sigma means? Six Sigma means you're at 99.9999. You're going to Sig Fix. And I was like, oh, I didn't actually know that. And he's like, yeah. So when you talk about, you know, Dowdy having a 95% yield rate or Middle River having a 96% yield rate, he said, that's okay, but that's not okay for the semiconductor industry. We have to be 99.999. Keep going, right? That's six sigma, eight sigma. And I was just like, oh, yeah, I, I don't know that that's that common in composites. <laughs> and he's like, well, that's just process control. It's, it's yeah. you know, and that's why you use sensors and that's why you use the artificial intelligence and these software tools. And and part of it, like I put down the velocity, is is helping to work out the supply chain issues, mitigating the higher cost right now. Um, trying to not be the cog in the supply chain that draws the tier one down or, or holds the OEM back. Um, and then also sustainability. We're trying to reduce our emissions. We're trying to be more efficient, less waste. Um, you know, Velocity said they cut their waste by 20%. Middle River has gone from 15 to 20% down to 2% carbon fiber waste. And Mitch's point is like, hey, if you're paying 60 to 100 pounds or more for carbon fiber prepreg, you don't want to have these high waste rates. You have to pull this down. This is part of what you have to be doing. And it's an ongoing issue for every program. Every new program you have, you have to you know, go back in and look at it and look at how to do this efficiency. And then part of this LCA, this life cycle analysis, this move towards sustainability is putting it in all of our software. And so that's one of the things I want to talk about in the future. Um, hopefully I'll be able to do a CW training on this toward December. But I've seen so many companies now, and I'm sure I just have a fraction of who's doing it here, but Dowdy talked about it, and they talked about the software they've been using to do um, life cycle analysis and roll that into their process development and their product development. Um, Hexagon Manufacturing Intelligence has started it, being able to actually account for a recycled polypropylene with a, a fiber reinforcement in their Digimat software. Um, the Clemson Composite Center can do that. They have an LCA plugin that works with their CAD program and software. The National Composite Center has done an extensive amount of work, and they have a huge um, program on this that they are reporting on and putting news releases out. So, and then what Tore just put out that they have this resin database now, and this is a tool they're offering their customers, and they're using AI so that you can be more efficient in looking at the resin for your molding operation. Um, and we know resin is important when we look at what works best with carbon fiber and how it's going to work in our processes. But they said one of the other reasons they're doing it is to try to help the customers achieve, uh, achieve their sustainability goals. So helping them look at things like life cycle analysis and carbon um, dioxide emissions. Great, thanks. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up with um, some comments of my own. This says LCA and recyclability, but this is really more about um, materials use in maybe non-traditional ways. I already talked about AvCarb. The really interesting thing about AvCarb was that they're consuming um, non-carbonized carbon fiber materials, often either paper or or even just straight up um, toes, and they're converting it into these fabric forms and these non-woven materials that they then coat and treat for use in fuel cell applications. And like I said earlier, it's highly atypical, but really, really interesting use of, of carbon fiber. 
And the the key technology for Avcarb is is in the um, the carbonization lines. They have several carbonization lines, highly tuned to produce carbon fiber with with the material pr properties that they really need for these for these particular products. Um, I talked about the Z strength <clears throat> properties of the Boston Materials and what they're doing there. Um, it's just a very different use of carbon fiber, really imaginative and innovative use. Uh, to build that interlaminar shear strength. Talked about Orbi and thermoplastics. Um, and one thing I've not talked about yet is uh, I had a recent visit to Albany Engineer Composites. So we first visited, actually it was you, Ginger, who first visited Albany back in 2014. And Albany had just um, won a contract to produce uh, fan blades and fan cases for the Leap Engine. And they had a joint venture with Saffron. And they have this facility in Manchester, New Hampshire, that's that was set up to do that. Now they have a, a facility in Mexico. There's another one in France, and they're all doing similar work. Um, and Albany invited me back because they wanted us to see how their operations and their M&P capabilities have changed since 2014. And it was really eye-opening because, as Ginger talked earlier about building efficiencies and reducing waste, that's the exact same path that Albany has been on. Um, when you look at how many fan blades and fan cases they have to produce, and when you talk about a rate of, as Ginger said, 75 by 2025, um, it's incumbent on companies like Albany and, and throughout the supply chain for Airbus and Boeing to build those efficiencies, which means reducing waste, being more efficient, being faster, better process control, and all of that is happening at Albany. So that tour will be coming out soon as well. So it's been a really interesting uh, last few months for us. Um, we've got a lot on our docket for next year. Um, we've got several tours scheduled for next year as well that we hope will shed some light on what the uh, industry is doing in other places. Uh, I know I've been invited to visit Joby. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and Ginger's got quite a few as well. And then um, our other technical editor, Hannah Mason, will be out in the field. So. Um, it's been an interesting few months. We're looking forward to uh, to what 2023 has in store. And I want to thank you for tuning in to CW Trending. And thanks, Ginger, for, for, uh, for your insights today. Appreciate it. Thanks to everybody.